as an architect, you start off with a blank sheet of paper uh, and you have a concept of to what you think the answer would be, then you've got to make the damn thing stand up. And that involves what are you going to use as a material? And concrete was the logical material. Just to introduce you to the star of our show, wonderful Owen Luder, um, a very modest man. So I won't say he's a um, legendary architect and a giant of 20th, 20th century architecture, um, also known as the father, godfather, of brutalism. So the question is, how did a young person from modest background in the capital city get to be the, the twice elected president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I didn't set out to design brutalist buildings. At that moment in time, which is the late back end of the 1950s, <coughs> early 1960s, everything was changing. Commercial development was taking off. The top architects in this country were so bloody noses. They didn't want to get, but didn't want anything to do with developers, nasty developers talking about money. My so-called brutalist buildings are concrete, purely and simply because that was the material to use. A, it was the one that was in ready supply. Concrete then became the standard work. It became a derogatory word that, uh, um, you know, something was terrible concrete, bloody concrete again. I mean, I did a shopping centre in Bath. There's no concrete in sight anywhere. I wouldn't have got away with concrete in Bath. It had to be Bath stone. So they still called it a concrete monstrosity. I started as a very small practice, say, doing ladies' hairdressing salons for commercial development. The practice expanded during the early 60s, expanded very, very rapidly. I was getting a lot of publicity. I mean, I'd written an article in the Architects' Journal in 1963 on uh, unlimited liability and, and how we needed to change. I said, look, we're not professional Victorian professional gentlemen any longer. I realised, of course, that if I wanted to change the profession or be part of the change, real change in the profession, I had to work inside it. It was no good just shouting my head. I was getting nowhere shouting my head off outside. And, of course, I was... Um, ostracised, ridiculed, told I didn't know what I was talking about. I was at a, at a dinner. The then uh, registrar of what was then the Architects' Registration Council of the United Kingdom was supposed to be sitting alongside He wouldn't sit alongside me because I was heretic, <laughs> limiting liability professional gentlemen, by the way. So what I did, I was beginning to get very known. I was beginning to get known, obviously, as an architect. My buildings had been making a, an impact, and the practice, of course, was growing very rapidly. So in 1967, I stood for council, and uh, I got on. How did, you, how did your encounter with Prince Charles come about in, in, the, car, in the carbuncle um, story? <laughs> Ah, well, that's the famous sod you. You said I shouldn't say bloody, I said sod. <laughs> Michael Hasseltine was the, the Secretary of State for the Environment at that time, the Cabinet Minister. He came to me and said, um, said Owen, he said, we've got a site, we've got to build an extension to the National Gallery, we've got a site. I said, no, it's the Hampton site, it's a long site, it's been empty for years. And uh, he said, yes, he said, and we want to do a developer architect design competition for it. They had lots and lots of entries. They got down to a seven, seven short list. And I'm in there, and of course, I knew the, the, uh, the architectural correspondent at the time. And he came sidling up to me, and he said, the seven, seven shortlisted schemes there, he said, uh, he said, what do you think of a mine? Now, I knew the game. I should have said to him, off the record, in which case nothing would have appeared. And that would have been a pity the way it worked out. And of course, I didn't say off the record. So I said, oh, well, you know, those, those three are just commercial development, not very good. The, the, the scheme there, the architect there, uh, who's really is, is Richard Rogers' scheme, I said, he's the architect who said, that's what I think the answer is, and sod it. <laughs> Suddenly, I was in the middle of a media storm. 
because of all that publicity, Prince Charles then got involved. He under, and he got involved. ABK were then selected and they did a revised scheme and it was the revised scheme that in fact Prince Charles then came in and, and, uh, uh, and said about the, the carbuncle. But what is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. But of course, uh, as a result, I, I mean, I was writing a regular column in building and I did a building uh, article in my building column which effectively I said, look, Prince Charles is quite right to tell us we've got to do better, but I'm sorry to say that better isn't necessarily the way he thinks is better. I was going to be evacuated and I was uh, on the way to Wilson's Grammar School to be evacuated uh, with my little case and my, car and my gas mask and my cardboard box over my arm and uh, I got down to the, to, to the gate, to the main gate to Wilson's Grammar School and mother said to me, do you want to be evacuated? And I said, no, I don't want to be evacuated. <laughs> So she's all right, we won't. So we just turned around and went back. Now, that was, now, I mean, that changed my life because if I'd have gone with Wilson's Grammar School evacuation, I'd have been a grammar school kid. I don't know what, what would have happened. But as it was, we went back. And of course, then I lived through the Blitz. The air raid warning had gone. We'd stand, we heard some planes coming. We thought it was a squadron of, of uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes. And so we both stood on top of the Anderson shelter so we could wave at them and, sh and cheer them. And of course, it was the squadron of ME109s, the German fighter, and very menacingly, a whole squadron of Heinkel 111 bombers. But the whole thing about the Blitz was, if you don't believe, and I can assure you it is a fact, the human race is very, very adaptable. It's amazingly adaptable. And you'd be surprised the way people adapted to the fact that every night during the Blitz, they went into the shelter whether it was the tube or whether it was an Anderson shelter or a brick shelter, they went into the shelter. We're just going to have a little pause for breath. And, uh, <laughs> and we're just going to... Um, this is to do with your background. Right. Your background and um, one of your beloved musical songs. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Cockney. My grand, great-grandfather, uh, my grandmother was a real Cockney. Follow the band and don't dilly dally on the way. Off went the band with me home packed in. I followed on with me old cotton in it. I dilly, I dally, I dilly then I dallied. Lost, I lost the way and don't know where to run. Oh, you can't stretch the costas like the old time coppers when you can't find your way home. Now, that, that song echoes something that was classic, uh, classic sort of cockney. The landlord was sent their rent collector around every Monday morning. A lot of those families, you know, a lot of children, uh, not very much money. And so there was the cockney thing of the midnight flit which was effectively meant that on the, uh, on the weekend, on the Saturday or the Sunday, you would get a barrow and you'd pile all your belongings on and you'd leave the house and you'd go on to another one you rented and it was the midnight flat. And that is that song. That's what that song is all about. I, a young girl, and have just come over All from the country where they do things big And amongst the boys I Gallery.
were talking about when you first started off, how you went from one man and a dog, really up to 25 in about four years, I think you said. Um, and talking about, you know, your areas of change where you made a real impact. What sort of qualities did you look for when you were appointing people? What sort of were there any special qualities that you looked for in people? The key to commercial development, you had to move quick. So if somebody, if, the, if Alec Coleman or a developer phoned me and said, Owen, will you have a look at that site? You had to go the next day. And I built up a team, and the whole essence of a team, you must have people who think as you do. You can't delegate down, down the line to somebody who doesn't who thinks quite the opposite to what you, because that's a, that's a form of a disaster. Just in terms of your own buildings, do you have a favourite your own buildings? I suppose really the building that is closest to my heart is the Get Carter Car Park. It's a basic scheme, it's a three level scheme, but it's got two levels, uh, a high level back road and, a, uh, and a, a lower road. So two level shopping, and two level access. The basic scheme is quite simple. It's a series of layers. And then you, as you develop it, that's how you then develop the detail. Um, so I suppose, great said. And it's a building which also I feel um, should not have been knocked down. Genuinely, I am surprised what I achieved. Because if I look back at it, how on earth did I do that? Owen Luder, modest man and giant of the 21st century, 20th century architectural scene, and indeed the 21st century architectural scene, thank you so much for giving us the time to share your your life, Thank your you. memories, and your love of song. And that's only half the story. I've missed out the juicy bits. <laughs> <laughs>